everybody. How are y'all doing today? I want to first thank you as a director of the Delta Culture Center. I'm Kyle Miller. I want to say thank you so much to come in today. I know this is a Sunday afternoon. Uh, several of us, like me, get our Sunday naps on Sunday. If not your Sunday nap, maybe football. Uh, or whatever else you enjoy doing on Sunday. So I first want to say thank you so much for, for coming today. We've got a super treat for you today and we are just extremely excited uh, to pr present to you someone who's going to speak today who is a, we consider to be, a, most people consider to be an authoritarian as it relates to the Elaine massacre. Uh, you know there's two main texts and those are uh, Blood and Eyes by Chris Stokely and On the Laps of God with uh, Dr. Bob Whitaker. And Dr. Bob Whitaker is here today to speak to us. Um, and so Richard is going to give him, our education uh, director is going to give him a proper uh, introduction. But this is actually the fourth and uh, we'll probably do uh, one more in a colloquium series that we've been doing in preparation for the 100th anniversary of the uh, Elaine Massacre. And so with that being said, I just want to again want to say thank you and make sure you take time and enjoy yourself. At the end, uh, when, whenever Dr. Whitaker gets finished, I think he's going to invite uh, Sheila Walker, whose um, uh, uncle was actually in, involved in the massacre, and, there, and she's going to speak a little bit and whatever else he wants to do, because, because once he's announced, we're pretty much going to defer to him and turn the sta stage over to him. But after that, there'll actually be some opportunity for you to uh, have input and um, to have questions. And one of the things we're really wanting to encourage is that if you know information or there's things that you've heard or there's stories that you don't think have been told, this is a time that we would like for you to share, share those uh, things uh, so that we can add to the wealth in the body of, of research as we've been trying to gather even more accurate information as to what actually happened. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard Spielman. All right, thank you all so much for coming down, and I'm looking forward to hearing the speech as most of you all are. I'm, uh, Bob Whitaker has written a very fascinating book. I will tell you a little bit about him and about his background. Um, he also has not only has an extensive knowledge on the Elaine Massacre and, his, and what happened, but he's also done a lot of other very important work as well. He's been a medical writer at the Albany Union newspaper in Albany, New York from 1989 to 1994. He co-founded in 1994 Center Watch, which covered the pharmaceutical clin tr clinical trials industry. Uh, he, in 2002, uh, USA Today published Whitaker's article, Mind Drugs May Hinder Recovery, in its editorial opinion section. And in his book, uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic, he has also discussed his psychiatric drugs and the astonishing uh, rise of mental illness in America. America. Not only that, but he's also written several other books, uh, including The Mapmaker's Wife about survival on the Amazon, Mad in America about the, uh, about the uh, bad medicine and mental illness, and he's also written um, Psychiatry Under the Influence. However, what we're going to discuss today is another very important uh, topic that he's researched on and written, and that's a very important event that happened in Elaine back in 1919 on the Elaine Massacre. And he wrote this book uh, called On the Laps of God back in 2008. If you've not had a chance to read that book yet, it is a very fascinating read, a lot of great information. And uh, I suggest that, you know, if you have a chance to read it afterwards, you know, find a copy of that book and read that book. It's a great read. But anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Whitaker here, and uh, we're looking forward to his presentation. Uh, first off, thank you. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. I've really been looking forward to this. Uh, I want to thank you, Kyle. Thank the Delta Cultural Center. Thank David for making it happen. I have to thank Sheila Walker and Barbara Love for coming down and providing some support. Uh, you're going to hear Sheila's name and her family in this presentation because her family was very much tied into the very heart of what happened in, in Hoopspur and all. And as uh, Kyle said, uh, after I'm done, I'd like to give a, a few minutes so they can each talk a little bit about their personal connections, and then we'll have time for a, a Q&A, okay? And I'm going to do three things here. The first part is uh, I saw this as a pivotal event in American history, and I'm going to first look at uh, the 
the many things, influences, and the law that led up to what happened in 1919 in this area. So the first thing is, how do we get to this point as a nation that something like this happened? Then second is, I'll go through, one of the things I tried to do in this book is really map out in space and time where you can see documented accounts of people being killed. So I think that gives the massacre uh, a greater sort of sense of reality when you can say, this is, this is where it was, what time, and who was the group that actually was involved in the killing at that time. And then finally, uh, the third part, we'll look at the legal case, uh, which uh, was, done, was led by a man named Scipio uh, Africanus Jones, in my opinion. Uh, every school child in America should know about Scipio. He's a great character. But this character, this case as well, and this is part of what really attracted to me, this case was the foundation. There was something happens here in Moore versus Dempty that becomes the foundation for the civil rights uh, movement. So you can see this as, sometimes it's seen as, you know, this event in Arkansas. It's a national event uh, that really changed the course of our country. Now, I'm having a little trouble with... Uh, my slides, but you all can read this. So if we go back to the very beginning of our country, you can see this, this chasm between the promise and the law. So you have this wonderful promise in the Declaration of Independence. I mean, that sentence is such a beautiful sentence. It, it talks about the very heart of democracy, all men are created equal, and, the, and that... that <clears throat> They're endowed with uh, these rights, una, una, these certain rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, of course, in 1787, we get a constitution that is, in effect, a pro-slavery document. And it's not just that it allows for slavery in the southern states. It makes the federal government the, pro the, the protector of the rights of the slave owner. So you see, if a slave escaped, if someone escaped from the south into the north, the federal government was duty-bound to help return that property to the South. And in my opinion, if you look at the great struggle in America, it's about reconciling from this time the promise in the Declaration of the Independence with having a body of law that is consistent with that promise. Now, this was a big surprise to me. I always thought the Bill of Rights was a federal guarantee of rights for everyone. I mean, you know, citizens and all. And what you find is that the Bill of Rights, maybe it was meant to be a federal guarantee of basic rights, but as it was interpreted by the US Supreme Court, in this case, Barron versus Baltimore, it says it's, it's just, it's a curb only on the powers of the federal government, saying the federal government can't curb your, your speech. Or if you're in a federal trial, the, the, you have to have a right to a fair trial. But to say it does not limit the states, meaning the states were free to abridge the rights of their citizens. And that doesn't just mean, uh, you know, non-citizens. They could, they could, for example, many southern states made it against the law to speak against slavery. So states were allowed to abridge the basic rights of their citizens. So that's where we are when we, get, when we come to the Civil War, and the end of the Civil War, of course, what happens? They have to figure out how to protect the rights of the freedmen. So the 13th Amendment um, you know, eliminates slavery, but now they have to say, how are we going to protect the rights of the freedmen in the southern states? And they create the 14th Amendment. And really, the 14th Amendment is to say, is to say the Bill of Rights will be a limit on the states as well, and that the federal government will become a guarantor of basic rights in state settings as well, and so states will no longer be able to abridge the rights of its citizens. So what do you expect out of this? You see the right to a fair trial is supposed to come out of this, and all of the Bill of Rights that were, you know, were to be a limit on federal abuses now are supposed to apply to the states as well, and all these southern states, in order to regain admission to the uh, Union, had to ratify the 14th Amendment, okay? And so you get other things. You get the Federal Habeas Corpus Act, which says that if states, in essence, aren't giving fair trials, the federal government can intervene. And then, of course, the 15th Amendment uh, says states, you can't deny citizens from the right to vote on account of ra race. So this is a transformation in constitutional law. This is the moment 
that the const Constitution is in fact uh, in, in sync with that wonderful statement in the, in, the, in the Declaration of Independence. And you see what Frederick Douglass said, the black man is free, the black man is enfranchised, and this by the organic law of the land. Never was revolution more complete. And then what happens? You see very quickly that the Supreme Court begins tearing down this edifice of federal protection. And the key case had nothing to do with uh, black rights, the freedmen. It was a case called the Slaughterhouse Cases. And you can see what the court says. The protection of civil rights must remain with the states. To transfer the security and protection of these rights from the states to the federal government would, quote, radically change the whole theory of the relations of the state and federal government to each other and of both these governments to the people. So what they say in this case is you have federal citizenship, and if you're in, a, in an environment where you're interacting with the federal government, your rights are protected. But you also have state citizenship, and the states are still the guardian of civil rights within the, their boundaries and trials, state trials. Well, of course, what this means is this is going to let the states now, the southern states, start abridging the rights of the freedmen. And then you get the, the case, and there's one case after another like this, that creates the legal environment that's going to lead to 1919. Because the federal government's not going to protect the right to fair trial. Now in the United States versus Cruikshank, there was a government, as you all know, there was a period of time during Reconstruction where blacks were voting, blacks were having in, in office, et cetera. And so there's a, there's a uh, governmental, uh, an election for the governor, I think it was. Anyway, it's an election in Louisiana and what happens, whites then murder, and blacks are still trying to participate in, in the elections. Uh, I think it was 50 black men are, are, are murdered by a white mob, a KKK mob, and the question then becomes for the court is, should the federal government prosecute the men who killed the, the, uh, the black man? And the court says, no. If, the state should not be depriving individuals of life and liberty, but individuals can. And if individuals do it, it's up to the states to prosecute. So of course, once this, this decision is handed down, uh, basically the KKK that started up after the Civil War said, oh, we can now lynch people, and we can use mob violence to assert authority. So this is the case where the Supreme Court is going, in essence, to give an okay to lynching. And it's going to start happening after this. And then you see in Reese versus United States, they say, OK, the 15th Amendment prevents you from using race to exclude voters, but you can set up standards on who can restrict ways to restrict vote. And of course, the southern states said, well, we can figure out many ways, poll taxes, literacy things, in other words, to exclude blacks from voting. And then finally, you get a, a case in 1880, Strouder versus West Virginia, that they say the same thing. You can't exclude blacks from juries on account of race, but you can set up qualifications for being on the jury, which meant go ahead and exclude blacks from uh, juries. So here's Frederick Douglass says after these uh, Supreme Court decisions. Before he was saying, you know, there was this wonderful uh, revolution in law, and now he's saying it's a big fraud. And when, you know, I came to this whole story from the outside, and one of the things that hits you is what happened, would have happened to this country and to the South if the Supreme Court had up, upheld the 14th Amendment? Because it would have continued with a certain context where if you didn't have fair trials, this, the federal government could come in and set the men free. If you had lynch mobs, they could come in and prosecute those men. You couldn't exclude blacks from juries. So these this, these, this, these court decisions set, uh, sent our country on a different path. And it could have been a very different history if, if these decisions hadn't been made. Now the next thing, if you look at how we got to 1919, and as I said at the beginning, I see this as a national thing, a national tragedy. If you deprive the rights of a group of people, you have to convince yourself not that you're doing wrong, but for some reason they don't deserve rights. You have to make them the other and unworthy of the rights. And so what you see is American science stepping forward. Now, it first does happen during the years of, before the Civil War. And you will see some, quote, scientists uh, in the South in particular. It starts in the South, saying that basically 
blacks aren't fully human. They are, uh, they're almost subhuman. And they're not like the rest of humanity. Now, we see this start in the pre-Civil War days, but it really takes hold now in the post-Civil War days. And you see such, comp such uh, arguments being made by researchers at Harvard, I mean, uh, anthropologists at Harvard. It wasn't limited to the South. And it became this national story that uh, basically said there was scientific evidence that blacks weren't fully human. And one of the ideas that they promoted, obviously this is complete idiocy, uh, was that the black skull closed earlier than the white skull, and therefore the brain couldn't become fully developed. And you now start to see, based on this scientific, the supposed scientific story, it's presented as a narrative, but of course, it's designed to justify uh, the, the taking away of rights, the, the, the mistreatment, the unequal treatment. You're justifying it to yourself. And you, get, you start to read this if you get it. Scientific investigations had shown that, quote, Negroes are not men in the sense which that term is used by the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, the NAACP, at its first organizing meeting, you know what the very first thing they took on? It wasn't uh, lynching, it was this. They said, at the very first thing, at the very first meeting, they said, we have to take up this question. Are Negroes men? Now, they were highlighting it because the denial of this sense became such a basis for, uh, you know, the, the racism, the lynchings, uh, you know, the exclusion from juries, et cetera. And my point is, American science creates a story that led in the early 1900s to, if you go back to the literature at this time and look at cartoons and look at comments by uh, Harvard presidents and all, you will just, your stomach will turn at the degree of denial of basic humanity and the degree of racism and the degree of sort of degrading of a whole, you know, ethnic group. It's astonishing. So this is the next thing we get going, is this extraordinary scientific narrative that, uh, you know, blacks are inferior human beings. So in 1919, the NAACP just did a book on the history of lynchings, 30 years, and you'll see that there were 2,500 people lynched during this time. And if you divide out by the number of weeks, that's about, um, why is that there? Why is this thing here? Uh, more than six lynchings per month. So in other words, every week you're seeing basically a lynching. And this was seen as they, they didn't even have a right to the courtroom. Uh, you could use this extrajudicial violence. Uh, oh, that's sorry. Okay. If this is just to give you an example of a cartoon going about this problem in law. This is by the NACP. And what you see, the cartoon is showing that people are, you know, uh, involved in doing lynchings, discriminating, and they're looking at the 14th and 15th Amendment and laughing at it because it, it, this, we have this history where it wasn't applied to the United States. So if you, you follow this forward, uh, 1900s, and then, uh, you know, Wilson gets elected. And the, the sort of, the hatred that you can start seeing in everyday circles in the United States is really astonishing towards blacks. But then World War I comes up, and this is going to be the war to make the world safe for democracy. And the, the blacks now say, okay, let's put aside black leaders, African American leaders, they say, let's put aside our grievances for now. Let's fight this war and show that we are worthy of being citizens. And not only did they want to enroll in the army, they demanded that they have the right to be in combat because the white army did not want black individuals learning to use arms. So they would agree to this for a long time. They finally uh, get agreed that 10% of all the people that in, are in, from African Americans that, are, that enroll in the army will be in combat groups and they set up two divisions. And one division is placed under French control and they become the first heroes of World War 
one. And you can see now in uh, major publications saying, now when they come back, they're going to have a right to citizenship. And you can see this promise is being made. And you can see this, look at the promise that Woodrow Wilson makes at the start of the war as they, as they sign up. Out of this conflict, you need expect nothing less than the enjoyment of full citizenship rights, the same as enjoyed by every other citizen. So this is the promise. Yes, you've been, we've been discriminating, and yes, there's been this horrible history of lynching, but it's gonna change when you come back. There were two divisions, one put under French control, they really excelled, the other one suffered, were placed under uh, white American control, uh, and they suffered horrible racism during the war. So they come back, and what was the message as they came back? The message was, as you were, nothing has changed. And the year 1919 is one of the most uh, tumultuous years in American history. So you have soldiers coming back, and uh, it's not just in the South, it's in the North as well. They're saying, get back in your segregated housing, we're not gonna get you jobs, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, you also have unions organizing and there's worried about communism taking over the country, that this is the Red Scare. Uh, so the country is in complete sort of chaos. They're afraid of communists, they're afraid of unions, and they're afraid of uh, African Americans insisting on citizenship. And so what you see happen is a couple of things. You do start to see lynchings pick up in 1919, even from that further pace. The second thing you see is lynchings taking on an extraordinary degree of sadism. Uh, there's gonna be several people burned alive in public, uh, in public spectacles. And then fighting starts happening in the summer. And the first one is in Charlestown, then it's Washington. And what uh, really surprises the country is blacks are fighting back now in, in Washington, D.C. They're fighting back in Chicago, Illinois. So it seems like a almost a full-scale race war is beginning to take hold in this country. There's racial clashes in more than 30 cities. There were some, as I say, there was a couple uh, public burnings. And now if you go look at the papers in August and September, you see lynchings, you see there's mob that breaks into a hospital and kills somebody. It's like the country is coming apart. And there, this is my, one of my favorite quotes. No one who was in the United States in the autumn of 1919 will forget the feverish condition of the public mind at that time. There's so much fear and going on of what's happening. Now the final thing that is, uh, so what, as, we, as we go towards this horrible moment here in, in Arkansas, what I'm trying to say is this was the culmination of a lot of national influences in law, science, the war, and now we have a local economic situation. Look at the price of cotton. You see what it was in uh, 1914? Seven cents um, per pound. Now, in the fall of 1919, they were forecasting that it was gonna hit 50 cents a pound, and actually there is, here in Helena, it did hit 50 cents a pound. And under the sharecropper agreements, the sharecroppers at this time were supposed to get half the the, the, the revenues from the sold cotton. Now they may have uh, run up, uh, got money from, a, got goods from a commissary during the year. Uh, they might have bought shoes, that sort of thing. But that expense should have been around $200 for a family, something like that. And if you look at these prices, someone that was, uh, it was a sharecropper on say 20 acres, they could be expecting uh, over $2,000. And $2,000 in 1919, uh, a Model T cost $250. So this was an extraordinary amount of money. And so the sharecroppers in this area, uh, starting from ratio going up, they began organizing a union. The leader was Robert Hill. He was returned from the military service. And his, his uh, um, you know, was fight for your rights and that sort of thing. But really what he was doing, he was helping the unions organize with the thought they would hire an attorney, a man named Ulysses Bratton, who was a former federal prosecutor, to sue the plantation owners to make sure they got a fair accounting this, this year with so much money at stake. So this is what's happening. Now with all this going on, 
The thought that uh, sharecroppers in the Elaine Phillips County were organizing a union was a, and thinking of hiring a federal prosecutor, uh, who by the way had opened an office in Helena, this was a threat to the whole power structure. And a committee organized, I think it was basically in early summer, to keep track of the racial situation and they began stockpiling arms in the courthouse in expectation there might be this rising up of the sharecroppers. So you have all these economic things and it's all gonna come to a head uh, on this night. And again, what I hope you see in this first third of this talk, it's not a thing of Arkansas. <laughs> it's not something of even the South. It's a national sort of organization and telling of stories uh, and fear of uh, unions. And, this, and, and, and what happened in World War I that brings us to this horrible moment. And literally, as this is happening, there is worry that we're on the brink of a national racial civil war. So many of you I know know the story, but in Hoopspur, which is about three miles north of this town of, of Elaine, uh, there was a little community there. There was a post office there. There was a church there. So they meet this night. And this actually is the first meeting to organize this union with the intent of getting their due this year when the cotton is picked. But they have been warned not to meet. Ed Ware, which is, uh, was sort of one of the leaders of the union, had been threatened with some lynching if they met. So they placed guards out front. Now, this initial moment is a little bit clouded in, in in uncertainty, but here's what we know. We know this church gets shot up, and uh, we know that one of the women in this church, Vina Mason, is going to get shot, and we know that the sharecroppers are going to uh, escape out the back uh, windows. One of the, two of the members that are, more than two, were members of Sheila's family. So Sally Giles was there. She lived close to there. Her, uh, Sally was your grandmother great-grandmother. Her grand-uncle uh, Albert was there, Milligan was probably there, and Annie was there too as well, uh, your grandmother. So they gather there. We do know that this gets shot up. Now you see over here the, the Model T. There was a group that came down from Helena. Uh, there were some uh, security agents from the Missouri Pacific uh, Railroad arm. One was W. Atkins, and these, they were sent out clearly with knowledge of the Helena authorities. They stop, there's some exchange of gunfire, there's some sign that there's a second car that shoots as well, and a man is killed, W.A. Atkins, so he's, he, he's, he's killed. So now, uh, the word gets back to Helena that a, a white security officer with the railroad has been killed, and the message that goes out, and they already had a telephone tree in case the uh, sharecroppers were going to rise, the, the black insurrection is now at hand. And so they organize a posse to go out and, you know, to put down what they think is an insurrection and go after the Hoopspur members. Now, a little known fact is this. A man named Henry Smitty and a couple other uh, agents actually go out into the Hoopsburg area before the posse arrives, the organized posse, and people just, there was no problem. I mean, they began arresting people, but there actually was no resistance when they just went there that way, okay? So, now let's map it out in space and time. So, if you look when they're leaving Helena, they leave about 8.30 on the morning of October 1st. So, the, the previous one was at 7.30. This is a picture of the Helena Posse's head out. So, what I did, uh, I need to make sure this fits. One of the things I tried to do in this book was use documents of the time. And the documents of the time include newspaper accounts from Memphis papers, Helena papers, uh, Little Rock papers, some of the other area point papers, uh, documents from the trials. And if there's both white trials, and then there's a trial where there's a retrial where Skippy Afropanis Jones is the attorney. He brings black witnesses out. You see uh, information there. 
Ida B. Wells Barnett was the only person to interview the uh, sharecroppers, the 12 men condemned to die. You have that document. Then you can get documents um, where the, uh, the army, there's army documents reporting on what happened. There, then the Bureau of Investigation, which becomes the FBI, there's documents from there where they sent their investigators, they're reporting on things. And so you take the trial testimony, you take all this, and you can actually start now uh, setting in time and space what happens and the killing field. So the first is this. And if you can all see this, so they come down Route 44, and you see where it says Hoopsburg? So the church is up there way at the top, and then right there we get the Hoopsburg. That's where the commissary was. So can you see that? Okay. And then what they do is they make a right turn, and very quickly uh, the posse shoot a man named Lemon, an older man. Okay. So they just shoot a guy that's that's there. Now the word goes out. They're shooting. They're, these posses are shooting. The next there's a group of posse members that go up to Ed Ware's house. So that's number one. Then up to Ed Ware's house, they yell at him to come come out. Um, there is some exchange with uh, a woman, a man named uh, Robinson bur bursts out of a house, they shoot him in the back, okay? So now the message for all the sharecroppers is, uh, <laughs> we're not gonna be safe. So the sharecroppers begin hiding. There is some other piece, I, I don't know if this is fair enough. Your great-grandmother lives right there, <laughs> Sally Giles, right by the uh, Govan Slough. And some of the women apparently then that had gathered in Sally's house go in and hide in this loop. Now there's another group of leaders from the, uh, from the Union that have gathered in Jim Moore's house. They hear the shooting. They also go into this loop. Now the next thing you hear is this. Is they do hear some shooting and they are, they're worried that the women are being shot further north. I'm not sure that happens. But what we know, this is absolutely, this is not a black narrative. This is, uh, uh, this is really from white documents, okay? The uh, posse splits into two, and they now start walking down both sides of the Govan Slough, and they just start shooting the men hiding in the slough. And as there's uh, testimony saying, uh, we were given orders to shoot to kill. Okay. Now there is a white man who dies during this time named um, Tappan, James Tappan, but it's almost certain that this came from um, they're on both sides of the slough from uh, friendly fire, so to speak. Okay. And one of the ways you know that they're not firing out, there's no sense in any of the testimony that the whites going on both sides are hiding. They're just walking down, okay? And if you're getting shot at, you're not just walking down. So uh, the next moment, and this is Helena Posse's, okay? Because we're going to see different groups of people. Um, there's another group of men gathering here in Frank Moore's cabin. They hear the shooting up, up here. Oh, and by the way, so in terms of the number of men killed in the Govan Slough, you have documents of two types. Men that ran out, and they said they shot six to eight of men who ran out, and then they searched the, the slough and they said we killed another six to eight, okay? That's white testimony. That's not black testimony. That's white testimony. So that's the third telling joke. Now you have people here gathering. What are we going to do? Now, Moore was, had served in the military, and he says, we got to help those men out. So they start coming up towards the McCoy house, where some of the posses have now gathered. They come up a little bit, okay, and maybe one or two shots fired, that's the best we can see, both way and not, and then they basically do not engage. And they, they sort of disappear across Route 44. But there is another man who dies, who's sitting in an, uh, an automobile up here, Clinton Lee. Now he's shot underneath the arm, and when he goes, when he's brought to the doctor, the doctor does not even notice the shot because it's somehow it's probably a self-inflicted wound from sitting in the car. But now this is a, these are prominent men in Helena. So now there's a, a, a third a white dead. Okay. Now I just want to show you that you can read this. Um, these are all white witnesses. Okay. This is coming from. One of the men, uh, this man's on Go Band's loop, and he's saying, you know, we just went down and we shot him down. Uh, they were shot down and killed. Five or six came running out, unarmed, holding up their hands, and some of them running and trying to get away. They were shot down and killed. Henry Bernard, that's the, he was a posse member at the 
also as well. And he says, we went in there and I saw, you know, we shot another six or eight in there. So what I'm saying is you're seeing eyewitnesses. Now, two of the people who were shot in the Govan Slew were Sheila's uh, grand uncle, Albert and Milligan. Gilbert, Albert was shot through the head and he survived. Uh, and Milligan, who's 15 years old, you'll see that uh, uh, Smitty says, I shot him. He was not trying to shoot anybody and he didn't have a gun. We found him shot through the chin and a bullet lodged in the back of his neck. So uh, this is eyewitnesses to this uh, killing field. Now going forward, um, I talked about uh, this fourth killing field where Quentin Lee, where, uh, Quentin Lee dies, but you'll see what uh, Henry Bernard says, when we saw a black person, one of us would get him, but they never did attack us from there. And there's a sense that they were seeing, they were every once in a while picking off a black running that they saw nearby. Now the next killing field is reported, but this is one of those ones I don't really know. There's not enough, there's not, these other, there's documentation that comes together from various sites, okay? Here there's two reports of killing in and lane itself. About one o'clock on that first day, uh, the, there's a telephone operator that calls into Helena and says, uh, they're killing blacks in the town. There's fighting in the town. We need help. And that's actually that call that leads the Helena authorities to call Little Rock and Governor uh, Bruff, or is it Brow, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, uh, for help. So it's this call. And the Arkansas Democrat, I think it was, said, uh, it looks like there's, there's, there are 15 blacks that were, of African Americans that were killed in Elaine. We don't hear anything more about this from any of the documents at the time. It's just that one bit of information. And then a woman named Bessie Ferguson does a uh, master's thesis in 1925. She interviews people in a lane and, um, uh, you know, both black and white residents. And she says that they tell stories of a number of blacks who were killed. So that's the documentation for that. Um, it's, it's not as solid as some of these other areas. I'm just telling you where the report came from. Now, that's the first group. Helena Posse's come down, okay? So this is a local group. And you'll see that the local, often in the, in, you're gonna see that, oh, there were 14 to 18 people. You see the Helena World report. Oh, 14 to 18 maybe were killed. I think they're reporting what their posse's killed. And they're not gonna report on these other killings, basically, and they're not gonna add it to the tally. Now, the second thing that happens is uh, mobs begin pouring in, or, you know, from outside the area. Uh, and it's from, uh, you know, Mississippi and Tennessee. And they come in, and we don't have a great record of what happens, but we do know they came in. A lot of the ones from Memphis, of course, came in from uh, Helena going south, and they had reporters with them, embedded with them, and here's what they describe. So you'll see, I'm saying this is the sixth killing field. This comes from newspaper accounts of reporters riding with the mob coming down from Helena. And you'll see dead bodies were lying in the road, enraged citizens fired at the bodies of dead Negroes as they rode out of Helena. They interviewed mob members, how many did you kill? Plenty of them. Uh, Mer Mer Memphis Commercial Appeal, one of them had been struck by 26 bullets. Arkansas de the Democrats, the outside posses had numerous clashes with Negroes. When you look at part of the historical fog around this story, part of it's here. And in Griff Stockley's book, uh, Blood, in, Blood in Their Eyes, he's talking in particular about the mob that came over and just seemed to be engaged in willy-nilly killing. But we don't really have any good sense of the numbers. And the only real reports we get are, as they were coming down here, then there's almost an a aura of silence that descends, uh, OK? But here, just read, um, now these again, are white accounts of the killing by the mob. Henry Smitty uh, was an agent. He was, he was part of the, you know, with the posse, so he's on the ground the whole time. And he said, Negroes were killed time and time again out in the fields, picking cotton, harming nobody. Uh, Bessie Ferguson, she's the one who comes back. She says, armed bands of whites from neighboring countries, they begin a more indiscriminate slaughter. And then even the district attorney, John Miller, who prosecutes these cases, and eventually became a, I think, 
think he was either a senator or he, he went to the Congress. And then he, he gives an interview late in life and he says, that's when the real killing began. It's when these mobs came into Phillips County from outside. Now, at this point, so that's the first day, okay? And, and we, the call goes out during the middle of the day to Little Rock, we need troops. But the call does not go out to say we need troops to restore the peace. The call that went out to the governor was, Whites are ki uh, blacks are killing whites, you need to come and uh, put down this insurrection, this killing of whites, okay? So you can see in the Arkansas papers, they describe there's 583 troops. Troops include 500 men from rifle companies, 50 troops from machine guns, they're equipped with 12 machine guns. Many had served in France, and uh, uh, they're accompanied by a reporter, and here's what he says on the train ride. Every one of the 500 troops appeared anxious to get into battle. The machine guns are expected to have a poor, powerful moral effect upon the riders. So as the troops come, and they're going to come up from the south. They're going to come up, uh, the train tracks come up. Anyway, they're going to come up from the south, not through Helena. They're not coming to uh, restore order. They're coming down to put down what they believe is blacks killing whites. Okay? And so now, Day two happens. The troops are going to arrive in a lane uh, around 8 o'clock. But some of the mob from outside has bivouacked in a lane. And they go out early in the morning. And they go north. Uh, they go north from a lane. They come up to this road. And then they make a left turn okay, early in the morning. The first thing they do, there's a woman named Lula, Lulu Black lives there. And they don't kill her, but they beat her. Then they go to the next house, and there's a woman named Frances Hall living there. She comes out to yell at them. They shoot her dead. And that's Frances Hall. Okay? So in a sense of uh, the mob, we don't have great understanding what happened the day before, but you can follow them along this road, and the first thing they're doing is beating up a woman and then killing a woman. Then they go further uh, west, and in some sense they kill four or five so now, about 8.30, and by the way, so this account of four being killed, that's from whites accompanying, that's whites on the ground saying they killed four, so it's not, this is where I'm getting this from. Next we get the, why won't this, okay. Now the troops are going to head out, and Governor, uh, Either it's Bruff or Bro, I'm not sure. Does anybody know how you pronounce his name? Oh, bro. bro, okay. Okay. Uh, the governors accompany him, they go north, and they're going to follow the posses. They're going to turn here, they're going to see Francis Hall. You can see that in the documents, they say we came upon this woman. Now, as they come up here, there, there seems like there's a shot that is fired from some tree that whizzes over their head. And basically, once they get shot at, order goes, it becomes a shoot to kill order. And they're going to come here, and they're going to see this. And by the way, you know where I got the, the map itself? It was introduced, it was drawn locally at the time, and it was at, uh, introduced as evidence in the trial. Okay? Not that the killing fields are here, but the map. So they moved uh, through this first group of woods. Okay? And here are some eyewitness accounts. And there is a, a as they move through, there is one of their people who gets injured in the arm, I think it is. And he says, after Sergeant Pearl Gay was shot, they meet the, the uh, soldiers immediately laid down a field of fire. They killed many Negroes who were resisting them. You see what Governor uh, Bro says. They gave them orders to shoot everything that showed up, and they took machines out there, out there and let them have it. Memphis Press. So what you're seeing here is a document And they've gone there to hide. It's not that they've gone there to fight. And, and w look at this picture. Of, this is what, one of the photos. This is not people worried about being shot at. You can see that. They're just marching through the woods. OK, uh, they clear these two woods. We don't know the numbers killed in there. We don't have any idea. Here's one thing. There, there is a, there's also a trooper that is killed. 
but they don't prosecute anybody for that killing. And the reason they say is there's an absence of witnesses from the blacks who can testify as who might have been in there. So there's a sense that there's not many people who survived that were in those woods. Now the next killing you uh, know very well uh, here in Helena. There are four brothers, the Johnston brothers, who are a very uh, accomplished members of the Helena Society. Well, they came from the Helena Society. There's a dentist, there's a doctor, there's a returning Louis. Uh, one of them is, uh, has returned from the war, a war hero. He fought in France. And then there's a fourth one, so these are, uh, these are the, uh, and they, they take, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but their heritage comes from uh, one of the most prominent uh, black families in Helena. Uh, I think one of their ancestors was in Compton, the city. They've been hunting. They're warned about going north because they don't know about this. They're arrested in a lane. One of the persons who arrested them said they were arming the sharecroppers, which is ridiculous, of course. But anyway, they're arrested. It seems they're cuffed. And then as they get somewhere up towards uh, 10, you see up, 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 up by the church, uh, they're killed, and their bodies are put on the side of the road. Now, one of the men in the car, a, a man named Orly Lilly, is also shot in its you know, the, the story told is that one of the Johnson brothers, who supposedly are handcuffed, reached for a gun and shot them. We don't know. But there is, the first account was how they were actually handcuffed in there. Anyway, so um, that's four. And this is just a picture of three of the brothers. He had a, he had a uh, prosperous uh, dental practice in Helena. This is a doctor. He came back wounded, by the way. Okay. Other reports. Uh, we get uh, reports in the newspapers that there were some killing of Melwood residents, and it's unclear whether it's a total of five or three, but they appear in the newspapers. Sometime between midnight the previous night and noon on this uh, second day of killing. Then there is, uh, this is a, an old railroad spur that went from a lane to a big plantation called the Lambert Plantation. Uh, it was by Gerard Lambert. And we get reports, first of all, that several blacks were killed by possum members or maybe mob members who were taking over this uh, railroad spur. So we get uh, accounts of that. And then we get an account when the troops, so what happens is the troops clear those woods from in the morning. They Now around noon, the commander says, okay, I'm going to break up my troops and they're going to go to different areas. He sends one group of troops out to Landbrook Plantation. And here is the owner's account of, and I'll just let you read that. That's the owner's account of what happened when the troops around, uh, arrived on the uh, Landbrook Plantation. I think you can see the utter brutality and the utter sort of uh, you know, sadism that's happening here. But this is troops. And I think you're going to start to see the theme is most of the killing was done by the US Army. And when we, when we put all this together, it's, we have three, we have the local posses in that first morning, which really was mostly around the Govan Slough. Then we have the mobs come in. And then we have the troops, and it's the troops who are going to do most of the killing. Now, we don't know what goes on after this. There is going to be reports of you know, others dead. OK, so noon on that second day, uh, Isaac Jenks is going to send troopers to different parts. One of the things he's going to do is going to sort of regather here. He's going to send troops to go through these cotton fields and take away all the guns of everybody. He's going to disarm everybody. Now, we do not see at that time any accounts of them killing people as they move from cabin to cabin. Not on this, this moment. In fact, uh, Albert and Milliken are, are, troops come upon Albert and Milliken and actually take them to Helena for treatment. 
But there's a, a, an Arkansas newspaper man named L.S. L. Sharp Dunaway, who writes a 1925 book, and he was like newspaper man of the year. I hope you see I'm trying to give you what the source is. And anyway, he reports that the troops went through this cotton field and did a lot of uh, wanton killing. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. It doesn't show up in any local in newspapers, etc. but I don't know. And it could have been both. There could have been some killing of people as they went to disarm people. At the same time, they were sort of taking a few wounded people to the hospital. Next. That afternoon, there's some blacks out, African American sharecroppers hiding just outside your uh, big grandmother's house. You see the wounds, number 15. And you'll see this in the newspapers that there's some, maybe 100 to 400 trapped in those woods. And they say, oh, because by the way, after the first woods were cleared, you get some newspaper reports saying, oh, it's going to be over. And they say, uh oh. Afternoon, we get some more fighting. 100 to 400 said to be trapped there. And you can see the newspaper accounts. There was a lull this morning, followed by intense shooting and rioting. And it is estimated that the number of dead and injured will be 100 people. And there's a report that they're surrounded by a number of troops. And we know that machine guns are used there. And they go through two woods. There's so only 50 there, across the road, and clear the woods out there as well. Again, what you can see here is a record that troops move through those two woods. You can see a record of uh, machine guns being used. You don't see any record of people being described as captured. Uh, and how many people were in there? I have no idea. You can see that the newspapers were estimating 100 to 400. I think they were overestimating as a way to sort of say, look, that sort of build up the sense that there was this army of black people out, you know, ready to do harm. That's what I think. But I'm just telling you, that's the documentation. And I think what you're seeing here is there is one specific scene after another where troops were seen as going through the fields and using machine guns. So after this, it's more sporadic. Uh, there's a, a soldier on guard with a machine gun in a lane. He kills a couple people. Here's another killing field we don't know much about. But there's a report now that the flex uh, traps lane, and they're going to clear that field, and that's um, early on the third day. There were said to be um, 50, there were said to be 50 in there. There was a report that 15 were captured. Now, we do know people were shot because one of the people who's going to be on trial is Ed Hicks, and he's been shot in the head. Okay, we now get a report about more killing out at the Lambrook Plantation, Hot Springs, New Era, 405, and these are just the finals. Uh, Local shoot black man in West Helena, Postel, Elaine, a black man in Snow Lake, and here are some other accounts of killing fields that are hard to locate. Uh, the one is on October 5th, they're not searching the woods between the big area of the Route 44 and Mississippi. Uh, the more possible more Negroes were being killed in the course of the drive through there. 35 men were reported to be captured, however, so I don't know there. Then John Miller, in his, uh, in his interview when he was older in 1976, he says that there were, at some moment troops, uh, a group of uh, sharecroppers ran up, ran up to troops on a train thinking they were being rescued and that they were gunned down by the troops. Uh, and he said, and they must have killed 100 blacks right there. It's really hard to figure out when that might have happened. I actually think if, if it happened, it happened when actually posses on, uh, well, I hide this dang thing. It's, it's when the posses went out, ah. Anyway, you know that railroad spur? Uh, when the posses went out to the railroad, uh, to, to, to the railroad plantation, there were some uh, sharecroppers that came from Lambert on horses that were then prosecuted for night riding. So that's one time when we do have document where people on horses approaching uh, a railroad and maybe, and maybe getting gunned down. So how many were killed? You, you probably, many of you have heard that the Birmingham Equal uh, Initiative is saying 238. I have no idea how they're coming up with such a specific number. What you can see 
is this. Well, let's just go. Helena World, 14 dead and 8 wounded. If you go into the Army, Army uh, records, they said they killed about 20 people for resisting arrest. But of course, they're going to uh, lower the number. They don't want to admit that, you know. Then the Bureau, the Justice Department say anywhere from 50 to 80. John Miller says more than 100. Henry Smitty, he's the security agent that was there all the time. He says 200 to 300, and then that way, 856. Here's what I think we know, is, is if you look at the killing fields on the maps, you can come up and the, and the um, you know, look at all the documents. We have 14 people we can identify as killed, okay, sharecroppers. If we lose the newspapers, we can get to a count of about 40 reported killings in the newspapers from these killing fields. We know that the outside mob, we killed plenty of them. That's an unknown number. And then the big question is this. When, the, when they were uh, clearing the woods, how many men were out there hiding? We'll never know, I don't think. Um, and you'll see, in the first one, there were 150 men estimated to be in the woods, which were reported cleared. Nobody was pr prosecuted for killing Luther Earls. Cotton fields in the early afternoon, that's what Dunaway, no number. Woods afternoon of October 2nd, that's what I was talking about near your grandmother's, uh, great grandmother's house. They said 100 to 40, 400 were in there, impossible to estimate number killed. Then we have two, we have the Cambridge east of 44, 50 said to be in hiding, 15 were captured. So here's what I think. I think it's at least 100, conservatively. Uh, and that's a conservative estimate based on that we can go through that we know the troops were using machine guns in these different wooded areas where men were hiding. And beyond that, I think it could be 200, could be more than 200, but you can get to 100 quite clearly uh, just by mapping out in space and time these killings and knowing that the troops moved through the woods with machine guns and that was reported by multiple people. So. The idea of it, whether it's a massacre or not, I think, is established. There was a massacre. Machine guns were turned on people hiding. Uh, and the extent of the massacre, we still don't know. I think it still exists in a fog. So, uh, and by the way, just real quickly, and then I've got to move quickly. <laughs> I'm getting behind here. Uh, the Hell in the World said it was the troops that did the killing later on. And you'll see uh, when there was a letter from a report from a, a, a black person that was sent to J.M. at Scott, he says it was the troops who did most of the killing as well. So now, next thing that happens, they round up every black in the area, anywhere from eight to a, a, a thousand, they take them to a lane, and now they're going to sort through them. So everybody gets arrested, and basically, here's what happens. There's a committee of plantation owners, and if you can get a plantation owner to vouch for you, and that you are a a law-abiding Negro, and not a member of the union, you were given a, ca a pass that allowed you to stay out of jail. It was literally a stay out of jail card. You could, you could be out. About 300 people there were sent to the jail in, here uh, near in the courthouse, and then they began sorting through them. The women were let go, and by the time we're, and the story is, in the white press, is the blacks had uh, formed a union to kill whites. And they had this plan, there would be a signal, they would ask for a settlement, and then they would shoot all the white plantation owners. That was a story told by the plantation owners. And you can see that this is just the headlines, planned massacre, vicious blacks were planning great up uprising. Then it's, it's, the, share, it's the plantation owners that uh, decide who can go free. Uh, and then 122 are indicted. And then very quickly, uh, uh, they're going to have trials. And here's how the trials went. They whipped and tortured uh, some of the sharecroppers to give testimony to those that they're going to uh, say killed either Tappan, Atkins, or Lee. And by the way, one of the things that you see in the documents is they said, oh, they put them in an electric chair and turned up the uh, electricity until the pain grew unbearable. And that seemed like a little, okay, this is an exaggeration. But what you find is in 1929, there was a case reported by the New York Times where the judge orders uh, 
he gets the story about blacks being tortured with an electric chair, and then they brought the electric chair they had been using for some time into the courtroom. So 10 years later, we actually got uh, you know, confirmation of this type of torturing that went on, and it continued to go on. So 73 men indicted for first degree murder. These are the members of the union, 49 on lesser charges. Now the, the defense attorneys are members of uh, the plantation owners, their landowners. They were part of the committee that uh, you know, organized the posses. They're gonna be the defense attorneys. Um, the trials lasted maybe an hour. They called no witnesses on behalf. They made no statement, so the defense attorneys did nothing. Trials lasted an hour. The judge sent them until they're going to be dead, dead, dead. Now, after we get 12 of these quick trials, which lasted about an hour, the rest of the men started saying, okay, I'll plead guilty to lesser charges. And there's something like 63 then plead guilty to second degree murder or lesser charges and quickly sent to prison. So we have 12 uh, convicted of murder that are going to be sentenced to die in the electric chair and 63 on lesser charge. This is a picture of the 12 that was ran in one of the Arkansas papers as they're taken to the state penitentiary. And there was a mob waiting for them there. Oh, by the way, one real quick thing, and this now we're gonna go to the legal thing and then I gotta stop this. Um, on the second day, when they first started bringing uh, uh, sharecroppers and their wives to jail here, the, a mob did form. Okay, mob formed outside the jail, and they were going to mob the jail. And the leader said, you don't need to lynch these, do a lynching. We're going to prosecute them and make sure they die in the electric chair. So a promise was made that the lynching, in essence, would be done in a legal manner. Just remember that, because this is going to play a key role in the trial. Now, this is the man who I think uh, should be known by all American school children, Scipio, Scipio Africanus Jones. He doesn't get initially his due uh, for really being the man that organizes the appeal and the effort to free the men because the NAACP gets involved, they have an, uh, you know, a press arm and they're going to be claiming credit for it. But the man on the ground is Scipio and actually he and several other Little Rock attorneys organized the, appeal, uh, the idea of doing an appeal themselves and went to the NAACP as well. So who is Scipio? Uh, Scipio was probably born in 1863. His mother had been held in slavery uh, to a man named, I think it was Sanford Remy. The Union's coming down into Tulip, Arkansas. Tulip, I believe, is south of Little Rock. And they'll flee the Union, they go south. And it's probably that the uh, Sanford Remy is the biological father of Scipio, and the mother is Jemima. So they come back then, following the war, Freedmen, and now they, set, they live in Tulip, and they're a sharecropping family. I mean, they're, are, you know, they're working the fields. This is in like 1867. I managed to see the census in 1870, and uh, there's one member of the family listed as literate, it's Scipio, because there was a brief time when he got to go to school a couple months a year, and he's the one literate member. 1880, he's still there. He's a farmhand. And then he sees like he wants to make something of himself. He goes to Little Rock. He very quickly gets, in essence, a high school degree. He does some preparatory school. He starts to become a teacher. And then in 1887, he applies to the University of Arkansas Law School. They say, are you kidding us? He even says something like, can I hang around and like help clean up so I can sort of get the law? They said, no. He gets three white attorneys that he can study under them. And he passes the bar in 1889. So he is, in my opinion, the first great civil rights attorney that we really have a record of. Because you know that the Jim Crow society starts really taking hold in around 1890. That's when they start passing segregation laws, uh, you know, the Jim Crow laws on the railroads. They're, they're gonna boot the, uh, so there was a black part of the Republican Party. The Republican Party's gonna start going lily light, white. And this man right away starts fighting that. And you can see here, basically, he spends years uh, trying to maintain a political presence. He runs for office. He organizes slates of, co uh, of candidates. He actually gets elected to the Republican National Convention. He defeats an Arkansas state proposal that was designed to eliminate uh, blacks from voting. And in 1920, he organizes a sit-in of a segregated hotel, which the Republicans have picked to hold their nominating convention because they don't want blacks allowed to vote. 
So all I can say is you can see in him the fight for civil rights was going on long before uh, you know, Rosa Parks sat in the, in the bus. And you see it in the, in the, in the life of Scipio Africanus Jones. That's his political life. Now, he's also the first attorney to create a record of, of, of fighting these new laws and, and, and unfair trials. So he becomes the first attorney to argue that a criminal conviction of a black defendant should be overturned because of the exclusion of blacks from, from juries. Now, he's going to use the 14th Amendment, but he's going to lose. But he's going to say, you should apply the 14th Amendment. He sues a planner for abusing convicts. He beats the Arkansas State Insurance Commission over a, over a racial thing. Uh, Defend, you know, successfully defends black Shriners. He's the first black attorney to develop a record on appeals, and he actually has a good record. Out of 18 or 17, he had eight wins, eight losses, and a tie. So he was very successful. And here's an interesting moment. In 1916, there was a municipal case involving two black uh, defendants. The white judge had to recuse himself. When that happens, the attorney in the room nominates someone to be judge for the day. And they nominated Scipio to be the judge over this case. That's how come he became to known, be known as Judge Jones. And there was a Mississippi attorney present who was so outraged, it actually led to a fistfight in the courtroom where white attorneys were actually fighting for Scipio <laughs> against the Mississippi uh, attorney. Anyway, that's how he, come he became Judge Jones. Now, you're the attorney. You're going to try to free these 12 men. The trials have been a joke. They've whipped people. There was no, no blacks on the juries, uh, no defense counsel. And so you go to the 14th Amendment, and what do you find? You find that in criminal trials, again and again, the Supreme Court said the 14th Amendment does not guarantee a right to a fair trial. So in Hurtado versus California, you know the, there's a right in in the Bill of Rights to say accused of a corporate crime requires indictment by a grand jury does not apply to state criminal. And now just read this. The 14th Amendment does not profess to secure to all persons in the United States the benefits of the same laws and same remedies. Great diversities in these respects may, that should be exist, in two states separated only by an imaginary line. On one side there may be a right of trial by jury, and the other no such right. Each state prescribes its own mode of judicial proceeding. You don't have the right to confront witnesses. You don't even have the Fifth Amendment right not to testify against yourself. And you'll see the court in Twining versus Jersey says, ever since the Slaughterhouse decision, it was firmly established that the 14th Amendment did not forbid the states to abridge the personal rights enumerated in the first eight amendments. And it says, the US Supreme Court can't judge state trials as whether they're fair. So what's Scipio going to do? How's he going to free the men? They don't have a right to a fair trial. That's what they're saying. So he appeals. He ends up with you know, different appeals. But with six of them, the court says, and these are the ones uh, killed for Clint, killing Clinton Lee, supposedly. Remember, he's the one who gets shot under the arm. Uh, that they had a fair and impartial trial. Defendants had been represented by eminent counsel. They deny the appeal. Okay, So that's it for the, in the Arkansas. However. Uh, I should, yeah, before I go to the Supreme Court. He, he did get the other side set aside, the other six. And the reason for killing Atkins and for killing a Tappan. And the reason is in their hurry to convict these six men, they convicted them just of murder. There is no such uh, crime. It's either first degree murder or second degree murder. So because they hadn't even decided that, they had to go back and have a retrial. And it's at the retrial where Scipio defends the six men, okay? And this is when you get the black narrative now that gets put into the court record. And the story is that Scipio worried for his life when he was here, uh, that he had to hide out in, in the houses of certain you know, blacks around here. I'm not sure that's totally true because there's also a story that Scipio went to the judge, not the judge, the sheriff, Sheriff Kitchens, and said, your job is to protect me called on the better self of Sheriff Kitchens, and Sheriff Kitchens did say, okay, you can stay here and we'll protect you. I'm not totally sure of that thing. But it, he now brings black witnesses to the stands, and there's stories of blacks in the upper part of the courtroom, because it was a segregated courtroom, feeling uh, just overcome with admiration for this man that was now making, in a white courtroom, in essence, the black narrative. 
And part of what this whole case is going to be about, there's a white narrative of whites rising up to kill blacks. And then there's this other narrative of a massacre, okay? And whites coming down to kill people organizing to get a fair share of the crop. And the real beauty of Scipio Africanus Jones is by the time he's done, within the courtroom, as he goes to the US Supreme Court, it's the black narrative that is the established narrative and supported by white witnesses. That's how great of a job he did. Anyway, real quickly, he has that second trial. They're convicted again, but Scipio had set a trap. They hadn't done it right in terms of how they excluded blacks from the juries. He got that appealed. So that six now stays in abeyance, OK? Scipio says, well, now we got to save the more six. He goes to the Supreme Court. He asks them to review it. He says, this is a violation of their 14th Amendment rights. And they say, sorry, no, it isn't. You don't have a right to a fair trial. So in terms of an argument of due process, they, they said, no way. It's done. And so they, the news says these men will be put to death. The day is scheduled. It comes so close that a paper in Chicago announces that they've been electrocuted. But Scipio had one last thing to do. He's going to do a writ of habeas corpus. Now, the writ of, a habeas corpus writ is the great writ of liberty. And what it is, it goes back to English law, is you can file a thing saying, these people that have imprisoned this person, do they have jurisdiction over them? OK? And if, going back to England, if it was seen that the people who arrested them, the local sheriff, didn't have jurisdiction, you had to free them. So what he's going to go, he's going to go to the Supreme Court and he's going to make this argument. Yes, states usually have jurisdiction over defendants in murder trials. But here they gave up their jurisdiction. They gave it over to the mob when the mob gathered outside on that second day and they were promised, uh, you know, to be put to death. And then he also makes it seem like there's a mob surrounding the, the courtroom when they're having the trials of these six men. That's not actually true because there was no need for a mob. You actually hear that the people in the courtroom are laughing is what's going on. It's like an entertainment. And the brilliant thing of this is this. In order to make this habeas corpus case, he, uh, and you can see the argument he's making here, he converts two people from the Missouri Pacific Railroad, Henry Smitty and T.K. Jones, to file affidavits. Now, these are the murderers. And they testify, we whipped these people, we tortured people, we, we, we put uh, rags over to make them feel they were suffocating. He describes how they went down and you know, killed people in the Govan Slough. He describes how James Tappan almost certainly was killed by a crossfire, and basically describes two days of killing. And he says 200 to 300. And he says, we, there was almost no shooting back, is what he says. So now Scipio, as he goes to the Supreme Court, uh, has presented a narrative of a massacre and a, a narrative of trials that was, was basically like a lynch mob within the courtroom. And the state doesn't even contest the narrative. They basically say, this is a state criminal trial. We have jurisdiction. So now this is the moment for the Supreme Court under Taft. And, and we're in a Jewish uh, synagogue here at once. There's a key member of this. It's Louis Brandeis. Because he's, he's got a, a sense of unfairness to certain populations. So now you're a member of the court. You've never set aside a, a, a state trial because of a lack of due process. You basically said you can do what you want. And by the way, people are getting beat up in, in all sorts of places, in, in defendants and all. But now you've got a story that is so grossly unfair. So are you going to reach for the habeas corpus or not? In other words, if it was a simple habeas corpus, whether the mob took over, I don't think they would have done it. But they were confronted with, with such gross injustice. And so what happens is they order further. They say, OK, if this is true, what's in this, these men should be set free. And he actually orders, the US Supreme Court orders a further investigation. But this actually is what uh, you can see. This is the decision. If the case that the whole procedure is a mass, that counsel, jury, and judge were swept uh, to the fatal end by an irresistible wave of public passion, and that the state courts failed to correct the wrong, neither perfection in the machinery for correction, nor the possibility that the trial court and counsel saw no other way of avoiding an immediate outbreak of the mob can prevent this court 
from securing to the petitioners their constitutional rights. That's the moment that this country changes in a different direction in terms of the right to a fair trial and the incorporation of the Bill of Rights into state uh, trials and all. So, and it's the lack of, it's the yanking of jurisdiction of, from states, which of course is so key to this, you know, to the whole civil rights movement and the fair trials because it's gonna be jurisdiction yanking is what they're gonna initially do. And I love this newspaper report. The principle that the federal government may constitute itself a reviewer of the decision of the criminal courts of states. Overruling, now they're not happy about this, by the way, this newspaper. Overruling the authority of state courts of last resort will, if established, constitute a change hardly less than revolutionary. People recognize this is a curbing of states' rights in curbing of their power to abridge, in a fundamental way, the rights of, 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 of blacks. Anyway, um, one last story, and then you all can read this. This is praise for Scipio in a black publication. When, when Scipio continued fighting the good fight all the way to his death, 1943, you said? And at his, uh, Scipio was an extraordinary man, at his funeral, which was at a, a very prominent black church in Little Rock, there were a number of whites who actually wanted to uh, pay their respects to Scipio. Uh, he called out the better part of human beings. So in order for, for, his, uh, for his funeral, they put a tape down the middle of the church and whites were on one side, blacks on the other, so it was segregated. But at the same time, you saw this, this man who had called on the better selves of people and that was being recognized. And you'll see just here, that uh, he became a real hero to the black community. Uh, Barbara's brother, Scipio, born two years before Scipio died, is named after him. So uh, I'm gonna retire here until we have questions, but I thought it'd be really nice to hear a little bit from Sheila since her family was at the, in the heart of this. Albert's, by the way, her, her brother Albert, her brother, good Lord, your grand uncle Albert. <laughs> He is uh, uh, tried for killing James Tappan. So he's one of the ones hiding in the Govan Sloop. And in the trial, they report that he has trouble speaking because he has a bullet hole on either side of his head and that people laughed at this thought that he was having trouble speaking. And Milligan, by the way, was sentenced to 10 or 15 years. And so why don't you come, and then Barbara will come up as well. She's from this, this general area and has, uh, first of all, she has a brother named Dr. Scipio and that's enough, but she also has others. What's so tragic about the Elaine massacre is that I didn't learn about it until after my grandmother's death. In 1973, I visited Hot Springs. I was uh, born in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I had been down there numerous times, but she never mentioned the Elaine, at that time, the Elaine riots. She never mentioned them. Um, she started to tell me and my husband a story about something that happened to her when she was a girl. And in telling the story, she got so re-stimulated about the events, they came back, rushing back to her, what we now know was post-traumatic stress syndrome. She never could tell that story until the day she died. I never heard the complete story. Until after her death, I asked my mother, what was she talking about? And my mother told me the Elaine riots. And I looked, up, looked them up, he had a computer, I looked it up, and I found the old newspaper accounts, the white narrative of the Elaine riots. But I also remember my mother saying that um, a lawyer, Scipio Africanus Jones, she says, got them off. Now when I was a young child in Hot Springs, I heard my mother and my grandmother 
and my great-grandmother talk about a relative that was sentenced to death. Unbeknownst to me, because Albert had died before I was born, I never knew him. Uh, that's who they were talking about. And when I was researching the white accounts, a name just jumped out at me, and it was the last name of Giles. And I called my mother back and I says, who is Milligan Giles? And she says, oh, that's your uncle Jim. Up until that point, I thought his name was James. And I says, uncle Jim was involved in that? And he gave testimony that, that they were conspiring to kill the landowners? I couldn't understand that, and I was kind of ashamed of it. But then, a few years later, I read Riff Stockley's book, Blood in Their Eyes, and a whole totally different story. And then, eventually, Robert Whitaker's book, and it gave me a, a, a bigger picture, and then even Ida B. Wells' book, her accounting of what happened in, here in Arkansas, here in this county. What I want to say is this is a pivotal mo a moment here in America, right now, 2018. And not saying that these things can happen, but they can happen, especially with the climate that we all see that's what's happening in America. And all I'm asking you to do is to look at the person next to you, at the person whose skin color isn't the same as yours, or nationality isn't the same as yours, religious affiliation isn't the same as yours, to look at those people as human beings. Now, last year I spoke here at the, at the, at the Heritage Center with J. Chester Johnson, who is a descendant whose grandfather participated in the massacre. What endeared me to Chester when I met him, or even before I met him, I had a phone conversation with him that was over two hours. And he asked me, he, prior to that, by email, he asked me to read an essay that he'd written in the Green Mountain Review. And before I ever read it, before I ever read a, a, a sentence of it, I said, oh, here's another white man trying to get over white guilt. This is white guilt. But something touched me in his essay. Number one was the fact, and he says this, he, he now recants this, not recanted all the way, but what he said is that his grandfather, because he worked for the railroad, possibly participated in the massacre. Now he says he's almost certain he did because he knew he was a Klansman, et cetera, et cetera. For me, that was, that's big, that's huge. Um, so when I actually met him face to face, all I could say was that, you know, I, I, I didn't see him as a white man. I saw him as a human being and his humanity and my humanity connected. So this is what I'm asking you is to connect with people that are not like you. Just connect, make that connection. Find something out about that person. And you realize that culturally, whatever religion you may have, the human connection, there's a, there's a commonality among us all. Just find that commonality, and then you'll, be, you'll, you'll reach that humanness in that person, and your humanity as well as theirs will come forth.
Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Love. I thank you for being here and thank you for your interest in this topic. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story, which I will try to make very short. I grew up in Deshea County, 70 miles down the road. I grew up in a community seven miles east of Dumas called Oakwood Bayou. This was a community that was founded by my great grandfather, Miles Leach, who built a community, invited people to settle, built a church, built a school, Miles Leach Elementary School, which is the elementary school that I attended. What's significant to me about this event is that the story, which I will tell you, which I grew up hearing, I thought was an isolated incident and a personal family story. Reading this book and learning more about the events here, I get to see my own family's personal story in this historical context, and it gives it a different kind of meaning. And it has this meaning for me. I grew up hearing stories about my great-grandfather, Miles Leach, and to me, he was a hero. He was founded our community, he built a school, he built the commissary, he did all these fantastic things. And I also grew up hearing about this story of his cousin, who had a farm and who was fairly prosperous with his sons and grandchildren and owned a significant chunk of land, and there were two white men who wanted that land. He didn't move off the land. He saved his bullets, and as I understand it, at that time, black people had to account for their bullets. A squirrel here, a rabbit there, a raccoon, and when they went to get a bullet, they had to account for the last ones. But they saved their bullets because they expected to be forced off their land. Sure enough, these two white men came one day to run them off the land, and they fought back. Well, these men went to town, reported to the sheriff, and the sheriff organized a posse, and they came out to my grandfather's cousin's farm, and they killed everybody there, 18 or 19 people the grandfather and his wife, the sons and their wives and their children and their grandchildren, and the little bitty baby who had been hidden between two mattresses in an effort to save that baby's life. So when my mother, who was the grandchild of Miles, would tell that story when she and her sisters gathered, I wanted to know, but where was my grand great-granddaddy? Where was Miles? because he was my hero. He was the one who, in my mind, was this great man. Where was he? And what they would say is that he and the other black men went to hide in the woods. That was a crushing answer for this little black girl who was trying to figure out her place in the world. So reading this story, Bob's book, I came to understand that it wasn't just something that happened with my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and the black men around him, but it was something that was happening actually throughout the state and throughout the country, and it put my understanding of my great-grandfather's actions into this larger context, and that was a big deal for me. I will tell you another, hopefully, short story and I don't have the exact dates on this, but this was a story that was told to me by my father's sister. So this is the other side of my family. My father's sister died at 103 this past June. But she said, in my father's family community, the word went out that a white mob was coming. So I'm assuming, though I do not have the dates, that it was around the same time. So the white mob was coming to run these people off the land because they were also fairly prosperous. They had their own land. They had their own community. They were self-sufficient. They did their own thing. 
So the mob was coming. And a white man whose name was Clay Cross, she said, gathered his five sons and they took their shotguns and they went and stood in the road that went to my father's family community. Sure enough, the mob showed up. And when the mob arrived, Clay Cross and his sons sat on their horses with their shotguns and they said, no, no, you will not go into this community. You will not bother these people. These are all good people and you won't bother them. Turn around and go home. Remember, I know who you are. And if anything happens to any one of these people in this community, I will come to find you. Go home. So Sheila left a message of connecting. I call this my standing in the road story. Clay Cross and his sons stood in the road and they stood between the mob and my grandfather's, great grandfather's community. So the message I leave with you is which of you are willing to stand in the road? Thank you. Thank you all so much for presenting today. We, we, great stories from all of you, especially Mr. Whitaker for coming. We appreciate it. For those of you who have questions, we do have some microphones up here. And feel free to come up and ask questions. And uh, you know, Mr. Whitaker will be able to answer any questions that you all might have. This one isn't a question. I would like to. Uh However, I uh, recognize uh, Griff Stockley, who is here. Um, yeah. Who pioneered uh, this, field of, this field of history. I uh, remember from the book the affidavits of Smitty and what was the other guy's name? T.K. Jones. Yeah. Um, I guess to what extent, or to any extent, did those affidavits of those guys that stepped forward make a difference at any of the trials? Um, I, 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 you may have covered it in the book. It's been a little while since I read it. I don't remember. And um, to what extent have those affidavits um, had a, an effect on the narrative? Yes, yeah, so the affidavits come up at the last second uh, when the appeal is being perfected for the Moore Six. So the affidavits weren't obtained during, before the trials themselves. So in terms of the, the, the first trials, which were the kangaroo court trials, uh, where there was really no defendants, they weren't present, of course. And then when Scipio defended the Six in those retrials, he, Th that was not part of the retrials. The black narrative began to come forth because of black witnesses, he called. Uh, but you can see in those uh, retrials, and by the way, it was Griff who found this documents, the retrials, I think, dug them up, and this is where we really get the uh, addition of the trial testimony into this larger story. Um, you actually start seeing the, the, the white narrative in that second one disappear. <laughs> because there's really no testimony about, you know, sort of an insurrection or sh much of even evidence that anybody was shot by anybody. But, so you get that black narrative, but it's before they go to the Supreme Court, uh, when they're perfecting that appeal, that Smitty, that Scipio, through apparently a detective it seems like, uh, is the one who actually goes out to them, uh, gets them to come forth, agree to come forth, and through his white attorney partner, uh, that's what seems like that, why they come forth, but it's only before the U.S. Supreme Court that we that that, that becomes part of the record. So, if you read the Supreme Court's decision, there's a, certainly a sense that uh, the trials were, you know, uh, a mask 
They're not, they weren't a real search for truth. Now they don't, if I remember, it's, 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 it's there, you know, you, whenever you have a Supreme Court decision, you do get a, a, dis, a description of the case. They don't really go to what happened, okay? That that turned them. But they're human beings. <laughs> And now it's not just a contest of narratives. You now have whites saying, we did the killing. Uh, we whipped these people. So, you know, they're not taking, they're, the testimony that they were focused on was, uh, the way it was, had a mob in essence taken over the trial. So in other words, did the, taken away that jurisdiction. So that's their, what they're focusing on and, and it, this was taken away. But I think actually, if you don't get that powerful narrative, Maybe they're not so eager to uh, you know, say that there was a mob that took over the trial. So I, I personally think that, that, that the fact that those um, affidavits come forth are, were absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. I don't know if Donald Knapp is here. That's what I was looking for earlier. He's a local attorney. I know he's been very supportive of this project. And I'm not a lawyer, but he was telling me something that just kind of blew me away about this. That I, I'd known the history, your book, but I, I'm not a lawyer, so I didn't understand the legal part of this. But the due process precedent that came out of this case changed the due process, but became the precedent for due process for the entire country and to this day, um, as the way he explained it to me, which means that as significant as this is in many ways, that touches, if that's true, that touches every life throughout the United States, including our own. Is, is, yeah. that, is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, in terms of, that's what I'm trying to say, where, the, where I came to this as such a pivotal event in American history, uh, is you, you, <laughs> this is the moment America starts at least getting on a better path and, 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 and actually towards a fair trial and, when, and, and sort of honoring some of this sense in the Bill of Rights. Now, again, they didn't, uh, they didn't, they didn't win on a due process argument in this particular case, okay? They, they yanked, your, what was the precedent was yanking jurisdiction from the state if basically a mob took over. But that becomes a precedent for yanking jurisdiction if, if in fact the trial is grossly unfair and in violation of due process. So that's how we get back to the sense that all of a sudden, you know, the Bill of Rights does apply to state courts and that if you don't have them, that's a violation of due process. So it's, 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 a, it's a pivotal moment in the reinvigoration of the 14th Amendment and the application of the Bill of Rights uh, in state proceedings as well. So you're absolutely right, and the, you know, some sense of a right to a fair trial. And it becomes the lever for uh, federal courts to order changes that, that really do lead to civil rights law and legislation and changing things. So in terms of like making it so blacks can be on juries, uh, it's, it's step by step. But the, the key moment here is, if, is that they're using the writ of habeas corpus to yank jurisdiction from the states. And they're now asserting some authority over state criminal trials. And they're setting a precedent for setting them aside. And if you really get into the due process, then OK, and if the due process isn't fair, now you can start setting them for violation of you know, Fifth Amendment rights, Sixth Amendment rights, et cetera. So in terms of turning our country on a path towards becoming a more just, a fairer country that honors citizenship rights, this is a trial that puts us in a new direction. And what I was trying to show, I mean, I came to this case from a very different angle. Um, uh, if you go back to that moment where I started this, that there's the promise in the de Declaration of Independence and a, the Constitution that doesn't honor that precedent. The, whole, the big challenge for America is to get a body of law consistent with the promise. And here we are in 19, and it promise flares up when after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment is a beautiful thing. But then we don't honor it. And so we go down this, if you want to look at this sort of arc of American history, we slide down into this horrible, horrible time, which in my opinion culminates in this red summer of 1919 and in the Elaine massacre 
We've reached the bottom at that moment. Uh, and then this is the climb out of that bottom. So that's how I see it as such a pivotal moment. I'll t and I'll tell you how I came upon this. Um, I worked in prison a long time ago, in Attica prison, following, I don't know if you all remember the riots in Attica prison. So I was brought in as part of a, a, a reform to Attica prison. And the idea was that uh, I, was part, I would run a tutoring program where you took men who knew how to read and had their high school degrees and they would tutor others and help them get their, their, their degrees. But that became, when I was looking for a book idea many years later, I, you know, I stumbled upon this obvious fact. There's no ethnic group in the world other than perhaps aboriginal people in Australia that are imprisoned at the rate that black men are in the United States. So I became interested in the history of the incarceration of black men from colonial times till today because I saw it as such a social failure that you know, here we would be, this land of the free, and there's a group within us that are being imprisoned at a rate higher than any other group in the, in, in the world. So that's actually what I started to research, was the history of blacks in the criminal justice system. And then I came upon this case, Moore versus Dempsey, seen as where the right to a fair trial starts from there. And then I read the, um, I read the uh, Supreme Court case, and I became fascinated by the fact that there was some unsettled history. I became fascinated by why didn't I know this? Uh, and I also, I did, also didn't understand the Bill of Rights. I didn't know the Bill of Rights didn't apply to state courts. You know, I thought that was from the day one. Uh, so it became a way, and I fell in love with Scipio, of course. Okay? So I read everything I could. I read Griff's book. Um, and from where I brought to this, I was hoping that I could see that from a, a sort of a national perspective of how we arrived at this point and then how we moved in a different direction from it. And so and that was the sort of perspective I brought, and it's the perspective that I, I think you're, you're seeing here. It changed the country, put us on a different path. And, I, and the other thing for me is I'm not a lawyer. I didn't know like this sort of history of like this. I, I think it's sort of a shameful history of the Supreme Court turning its back or you know, eviscerating the 14th Amendment. That's not, and I always, my memory of the Supreme Court is the one that was behind you know, sort of the civil rights uh, revolution. So for me, it became a whole different way to understand American history. Yeah. By the way, small thing is, Helena's history itself is a fascinating history. <laughs> the history of this town is utterly fascinating as, as you know, it goes through all these different changes as a sort of a, a raucous wild west town, you know, in the early days. And, you know, in the 40s, uh, it was a place for the blues and people from blues singers from the musicians would come over here because there were honky tonks on, on Walnut Streets. And so Helena's history, I don't think you want to, First of all, it's, it's really brave, and David's helping lead this. I think it's extraordinarily brave that a community is now really confronting this, airing this, is going to have a memorial to this. That is an extraordinary brave thing for a community to do, and for an individual to do, and an inspiring thing to do. And just going back to Helena's history is, I think sometimes when you bring this back up, people say, oh, this is a shame of Helena. No, it was a shame of the United States. That's the thing. It was a shame of the United States. Could have taken, and it was happening, there were shameful things happening all over in 1919. So, anyway, that's how I see it. <clears throat> Hi, as it was said, thank you for being here. Um, my question was, uh, we know that, uh, well, now my phone went weird, okay. <laughs> uh, we, know, we know that on the laps of gods brought uh, this subject uh, of, the, uh, of the massacre and the, and the trials that followed to light and the impact they had on, on society. But history is also a, a teacher. Uh, it it, uh, it uh, teaches us uh, stories to inspire and lessons and characters of virtue and failing. What are the lessons in your book that you believe we should keep with us today? That's a good question. Uh, first of all, you know, history is, uh, uh, 
I, I feel this history has been gradually rediscovered. There's been, you know, you can go back to, I think it was 1965, you start seeing some new inquiries into it. And w when you come into it, you hope you add something to it. You take a new swing at it. But it's been rediscovered in many, uh, by many people doing good work at this. And I know uh, Griff's book was one that really uh, put the mass idea of a massacre out there before the population. But you're asking me, what are the lessons? Um, the lessons are a couple. One is, uh, going to what Sheila said, if you identify someone as the other in society, as different from you, some group different from you, the minute you have that sort of sensibility, it leads to bad spaces. And if you're seeing people as brethren or as us, uh, that leads to a better society and it leads to a more just society. But the minute you start thinking those guys are the enemies or those guys are less than us and we speak badly about other groups of people, that leads us to a bad place. That's one lesson. Two, um, the importance of the law because the, what the law does is set a context for behavior. It sets boundaries for behavior. And if the Supreme Court had upheld the 14th Amendment, I literally believe the history of this country would have been different, and the history of the South would have been different, because behavior would have been bounded by a different set of laws. So the importance of a legal framework for us to be within is, is so, so, so important. And then I think the f third is we need to know our history. We really need to know our history. Because when you know your history, uh, you don't see the United States as born as this complete shining star, you know, shining thing on the hill. No, it was not only there was slavery, but it, we had a federal constitution that protected slavery. And I really think this is the big journey in, the, in, in America, is to create from that beginning a more just society. So you see the importance of knowing history for understanding how to move forward today in terms of politics and what should drive us. And then finally, I do think the lesson that could be is for teachers. We should learn about Scipio. You know, how did this man, uh, you know, what drove him? What sort of courage it took? Why was he, why did he comport himself the way he did? Because he did make a, 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 a dis, a choice of being firm and fighting for the rights of his people. But he, he was at a certain time and he did not, he tried to make a, a certain sort of common, he, he did try to reach across the aisle and call on people's better selves. And we see that in Scipio. So I think the lesson for teachers is the story can be, should be taught in school. And it, it, it gives us a different ver understanding of our history, of how fragile it is how it has gone to some very, 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 very dark spaces. And then we also can learn to honor and, 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 and be inspired by Scipio Africanus Jones, too. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs>